Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Bryla, and I am a team member of Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. Thank you, all of you, for joining us tonight. Um, and we are thrilled. We're so excited to have Dr. Doug Tallamy presenting for us. Before I introduce him, I would like to say a few words about our organization. SAG Moraine is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit in the near west and southwest suburbs of Chicago. Our mission is to promote the use of more native plant species in our urban and suburban landscapes. The ways that we do this is through community outreach, education, and by making native plants more easily accessible and affordable to our community. One way that we will be doing that is through our spring native plant sale, which will be held on June 4th, 2022. From 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Moraine Valley Community College, we will have numerous varieties of native plants for sale on that day. That will also be the pickup time for our plant packages and designs that we are offering for pre-order until March 1st. These are plant packages that have all the plants you need along with the design to show you where to plant the plants. And this will help make native gardening easy for the experienced and beginner alike. All of these designs were created specifically for Sag Moraine by Jeremy Ohms of Wild World Gardens. And he created lovely designs uh, for a full sun foundation garden, a full sun pollinator garden, a partial shade pollinator garden, and a full sun part shade rain garden. All of these gardens are made to be beautiful, to have four season interest, and to support our pollinators and our ecosystem. Uh, if you are if you live in the area and you are interested in you are inspired to plant more native plants in your landscape after tonight's talk, which I'm sure we all will be, um, please check out our plant sale on June 4th or visit our website. The link will be in the chat to learn more about our plant sale and these plant packages. With that, I want to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Doug Tallamy. He is a professor of entomology and wildlife ecology at the University of Delaware. He speaks nationwide about his concerns that the approach to gardening must change. He contends the widespread planting of ornamental plants native to other parts of the world is creating ecosystem-wide problems. Dr. Tallamy is the author of many best-selling books, including Nature's Best Hope and Bringing Nature Home. His most recent book is The Nature of Oaks, which was published in 2021. He has been featured by the New York Times, NPR, the Associated Press, and many others. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Tallamy. Good evening, Doug. Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes? Uh-oh, you're, you're muted. We can hear you just fine. Okay, good. I don't want to talk for an hour and muted. That'd be bad. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Everybody here, you're having some snow. I actually went downstairs, checked the temperature here. It's 62 out. So um, not snowing here in Southeast Pennsylvania, but it will get cold tomorrow. Uh, so I do call this talk, Making Insects, A Guide to Restoring the Little Things That Run the World. And that expression, of course, is not mine. That comes from E.O. Wilson, the great Edward O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus, uh, you probably heard he died actually the day after Christmas this year, and it's a tremendous loss to uh, the field of, of entomology and conservation. But way back in 1987, he wrote, it was kind of a theoretical paper talking about what would happen to planet Earth, to life on planet Earth, if insects were to disappear. And he called it the little things that run the world. His message was clear, life as we know it depends on insects. Uh, and if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would all collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is, is uh, bacteria and fungi and of course, humans wouldn't 
survive any of those drastic changes. So it was a pretty somber message, but it was fairly theoretical. Back in 1987, nobody was worried about, about uh, all the insects disappearing. As a matter of fact, we spent most of our time figuring out how we could kill them. Um, and besides, if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? Now this was, this was back in, in 1929, but you know, our attitude toward insects has not changed very much. This was a national campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects. It didn't say rid the community of insect pests or just the problem of insects. We're gonna rid the community of all insects. And that's pretty much the way the public has viewed insects ever since. And of course, even if we succeed in killing all the insects in agriculture, and we understand why we might wanna do that, or killing all the insects at home, not sure why we understand why we do that, but uh, a lot of people wanna do that. We still don't worry about losing insects in general because we think they're happy in our natural areas. There's two reasons why that's no longer true. And one of them is we don't have enough natural areas anymore. We've turned those natural areas into our cities and they are not designed to support insects. We've turned them into our suburbs and they're not designed to support anything. Uh, and our rural areas are not designed to support insects either. It's, you know, you're in the country, but they're not designed to support insects. Then of course we have agriculture. How about rangeland? 770 million acres of rangeland in the US. That's four and a half times the, the size of Texas, which is designed to support cattle. Of course, it's typically overgrazed and ends up supporting very little. Uh, in fact, agriculture, some form of agriculture occupies nearly half of terrestrial earth uh, today. And of course, these areas are not designed to support insects. We kill them every chance we get. The other reason that our natural areas are, are not supporting insects is that they are invaded pretty much everywhere with uh, a, a, the, the non-native invasive plants we have brought over for one reason or another. This is a typical natural area near me. It's White Clay Creek State Park, and it is thoroughly invaded with uh, our escaped ornamentals, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and Norway maple and ailanthus and miscanthus and privet and porcelain berry and barberry and all the things I've forgotten. They're all there. About a third of the vegetation in this natural area is uh, from, from Asia. And as, as you probably know, but we'll review, these plants are very poor at supporting insects. As a matter of fact, all the greenery you see here uh, are invasive plants because I took this picture in March uh, a few years ago when plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So all the green you see here does not belong there. And this is a natural area. So that's, that's an important message here. Non-native plants destroy the insect populations by replacing the native plants on which these insects depend. And our natural areas have been invaded by up to 3,300 species of invasive plants we brought in to this country. Now, when I was young and probably many of you, you remember sites like this. If you looked up at a, a street light, this is what you saw. There were insects flying all over the place. If you drove down the, the street, uh, this is what happened to your windshield. You'd have to get out periodically and, and clean it. Um, you know, kind of anecdotal uh, remembering, but it was real. I mean, these things really happen and today they don't happen. You can look at a street light anywhere. You don't see any insects at all. Um, so, it really does seem like we are winning our war against insects, even if it's an undeclared war. Uh, but now we're starting to measure it. So this was a New York uh, Times headline in 2018, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Of course, EO told us what it would mean. Uh, but the decline of the honeybee, colony collapse disorder um, and has gotten us to start measuring at least what's happening to bees because we recognize that they're pretty important. Uh, so here are just some, some stats from the Midwest. 50% of our Midwest native bee species have disappeared from their historic ranges in the last century. 50%, there are four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% in the last 20 years. So they're not extinct, um, but um, they're functionally extinct. They're now so rare that they, they are no longer performing their roles in their ecosystems. So species like the rusty patch bumblebee, you know, if you find one, it's great news but they're certainly not doing what, that used to be one of the most common uh, bees in the country. There are three species of bumblebees uh, that already may be extinct and 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. Uh, in Europe, they've done a better job of measuring things. 30% of Europe's uh, orthopterans, the grasshoppers, katydids and crickets are facing extinction. 
um, uh, Great Britain has, has uh, they they measure everything over there. Uh, they particularly like to measure their their uh, moths and butterflies, their Lepidoptera, and three quarters of Britain's butterflies are in steep decline. Like the V moth has declined ninety nine percent, and the Brighton's wainscot, uh, and the bordered Gothic are already extinct. So this is happening everywhere. You know, the, the, the statistics first started coming out of Germany. Uh, there was a study uh, not too long ago that said since 1989, um, German flying insects have declined 79%. That's a huge, huge decrease. There are 46 uh, species of moths and butterflies that have already disappeared from Germany. Globally, invertebrate abundance, and we're talking about insects here, has declined 45% since 1974. So the little things that run the world, we've lost almost half of them. And that was, uh, this came out in 2014. So uh, by this time, I think we have lost half of them. And of course, as insects decline, all the things that require those insects for food, particularly birds, uh, are declining as well. We've got 432 species of American birds that are threatened with extinction, according to the State of the Birds report. Um, now that means, it doesn't mean there's only five left of each, but it means the, the population trajectories are declining so quickly. We recognize that as, as the signal of impending extinction now. We've learned from the, the Carolina parakeet and the passenger pigeon that um, you can start with billions, but you end up with very few if the decline is very rapid. Uh, Three billion fewer breeding birds today than just 50 years ago. That's almost a third of our bird populations already gone. So why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons that our birds are disappearing, but we went to the, uh, the Rosenberg et al. paper to look at the original data set. That's the group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided terrestrial bird species in North America into two groups, the groups that, uh, the birds that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the birds that do not require insects when they're breeding. So things like uh, doves and finches can actually reproduce on, on seeds. They can make a little milk out of the seed and that's what they feed their babies. The group that does not require insects didn't decline at all in the last 50 years. That's telling. The group that requires insects decline on average 10 million individuals per species. So it doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest as you take away the bird food, you lose the birds. England has sterilized its landscapes to the point where Birds that are serious invasive species in the rest of the world, like starlings and, and house sparrows, are now red listed in England. There, there are so few of them. That's a sterile landscape when it doesn't support a house sparrow or a starling. And this is one of the reasons that the Washington Post uh, is, is, uh, has, has featured this headline. The UN, a recent UN report says that uh, we're going to lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. I don't know if you remember, but mm, three months ago, we removed 23 species from the endangered species list, not because we've saved them, but because they're already extinct. Uh, so this is actually happening. The problem is we can't let it happen. It's not an option. Losing the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on is not an option. So we have to start to act. And that's the question. Does it matter if we, if we lose our, our insects? Um, well, remember, they are the creatures that keep us alive. So of course it matters. How do we convince people it, it matters? Um, you know, most people don't love insects very much. So let's talk about something that they, they, a lot of people do love. Um, we are very bad at reacting to what we consider to be long-term risks. So if we talk about impending extinctions or anything, you say, oh, that's a long time away, it doesn't matter. We're pretty good though at feeling protective, at feeling parental towards other animals, particularly if they're in trouble. So let's, let's talk about birds. People, people care about birds. I want you to pretend you are this bird. You are a magnolia warbler. So now you have to think like a magnolia warbler. And you're about to do the most dangerous thing you're ever gonna do uh, in your life, and that is migrate. You've just finished overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of, of Costa Rica. Uh, and this is a timely talk because that's pretty much what's happening down there. The birds are getting ready to, to fly north. Um, so that's what you're going to do. You're going to fly north so that you can reproduce in the temperate zone. You're going to migrate. That is the most dangerous thing you will ever do. Uh, the flying is energetically extremely costly. There's a, a very high predation risks. Um, many of these birds fly right across the Gulf of, of Mexico. Somebody did a study a few years ago where they looked in the stomach of tiger sharks 
in the Gulf of Mexico, and they were loaded with migrating birds that simply fell out of the sky into the, the sea, and then the sharks ate them. Uh, physiologically, they lose up to 35% of their body weight in that single flight as they're flying across the, the Gulf. So it's, it's extremely taxing. And as a matter of fact, every time birds um, migrate, whether it's over the Gulf or over land, they're typically going uh, great distances and they will burn up 35 to 50% of their body weight during those flights. So when they stop, when they come down to, to rest areas, yeah, they're resting. But what they really have to do is refuel. They've got to gas up. They've got to eat. That's the primary reason they're stopping is to get more fuel. All right, so migration sounds pretty terrible. Why would it evolve uh, if it's so hard on, on birds? And that's a good question, but the answer is that migration evolved for the same reason any trait evolves. The benefits outweighed the costs. The costs are very high, but the benefits are even, even higher. What are the benefits of migrating? Migrants have access to more food than if they stayed in the tropics. Of course, in the temperate zone, we have a flush of new leaves that comes out very predictably. And following that flush of new leaves comes the insects that eat those leaves, primarily caterpillars. You know, in the spring, when birds are migrating, there are no berries, there are no seeds because the plants haven't made them yet. So what fuels the migration are insects as they fly north. And again, that doesn't happen in most areas of the tropics. The tropics are much more constant. Um, there's no big changes in, in seasons in, in most of those areas. So you don't have a seasonal flush of food uh, that, uh, that is, is anything close to what happens in the temperate zone. So it's the spring bonanza of, of insects that gave birds the opportunity to actually reproduce more if they flew north. So if they stay in the tropics, uh, they, can, they can rear two to four offspring per year. If they fly north, they can rear three to six offspring per year. And that doesn't sound like a huge increase, but it's enough to balance the costs, those very serious costs of migration. So that's it. It's increased, increased reproduction that balances the cost of migration. In other words, bird migration was only adaptive because there were so many insects in the temperate zone. What's going to happen if we take those insects away? Well, how much do, do birds require uh, depend on insects? There was a study that came out in 2018. I have no idea how they came up with this figure, but they said birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year. Uh, and the way they phrased it, you know, it reflects what people still think about insects. They said they eat 500 million tons of pests every year. Of course, all insects are not, not pests. Let's Let's rephrase that back and say birds require 500 million tons of insects each year. And if we get rid of those insects, you're going to get rid of many of the birds that need them. So when migration evolved, there were plenty of insects in the temperate zone to justify it. Are there still enough insects in the temperate zone to justify migration? And every time we measure it in, in just about everywhere, the answer is no. Let's just focus on the impact of introduced plants. On insect declines, this is crepe myrtle, of course. Um, we got a lot of introduced plants. Whether they're invasive or not, they are occupying our landscape. They're the first the trophic level, the ones that are going to either produce insects for birds or not. Well, we've, we've studied this for a number of years in my lab. This I'll just share the information from one study. We went into uh, hedgerows that were seriously invaded. So this one's invaded with autumn olive and multiflora rose and that whole slew of things I talked about. There are a few natives there, but it's mostly invasive species. We counted in a, in a standardized way the caterpillars that are in this hedgerow and compared it to the caterpillars in a hedgerow that's not invaded at all. Not one, we did it with four hedgerows each and we measured it um, many times over a season. And what we found is in the invaded hedgerows, there was a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the, the biomass, the weight of those caterpillars. In other words, the amount of bird food available in those hedgerows was reduced by 96%. So we're taking away the bird food that, that all of these, these migrants and residents need, and it doesn't affect just a few obscure species of birds. 386 species of neotropical migrants may no longer have enough insects to justify their migration. No wonder our birds are disappearing. We're talking about our swallows and our swifts, our orioles, our hummingbirds, our vireos, our tanagers, our buntings, our flycatchers, our thrushes, many warblers, 
And don't forget the, the uh, resident birds that don't migrate, but still require insects to reproduce. Most of you heard my statistics about ch chickadees, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make one clutch of a Carolina chickadee, just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. So if we don't care about losing the insects, maybe we'll care about losing the birds that require those insects. Uh, now, a lot of people say, I don't have a property big enough to support breeding insects and, or breeding birds. And that, that could be true. Breeding bird territories are fairly large. Uh, but you can support uh, migrating birds for sure if you put the right trees in your yard. If you have uh, ginkgo in your yard, for example, and the birds are migrating, they come down in the land of ginkgo, ginkgos produce zero caterpillars. So, you know, they're exhausted, they've lost 50% of their body weight, and they come down in, in, in ginkgos, and there's nothing to eat. That could be the end of their, their migration. So you can influence the, the fitness, the well-being of migrating birds by even putting a single tree in your yard if you make it the right tree. So what if I said to you, introduce plants are reducing your bank account by 96%. I think you would immediately understand that's not good. We live off of our bank account. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. And it's our ecological bank account that actually keeps us alive. It's not the little dollar bills in, in the building. It's, it's the functioning ecosystems around us and it's the insects that are running those ecosystems. This is serious business is what I'm trying to convince people of. So as I see, our only viable option is to live in harmony, live sustainably with the natural world that sustains us. I mean, what is, what is the other option? To live unsustainably? That, you only do that for a little while. How are we gonna do this? Well, I think we need to, to uh, practice serious conservation on private property. You know, we've got parks and we've got preserves, but only 12% of the U.S. is officially protected. 78% of the U.S. is, is uh, privately owned. 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't do conservation outside of parks and preserves, we're going to fail and it won't be nice. So we're talking about taking a, a suburban yard like this and making it a viable ecosystem so that it can support the insects that, that, that run the world. How do we do that? Well, first we have to understand what the causes of insect declines are. There are many. Um, Dave Wagner has called the uh, uh, insect declines or the causes of insect declines is death by a thousand cuts because there's so many things that are impacting our insects. Certainly the misuse and overuse of pesticides I've just, I've, I've learned, you know, I'm an entomologist, but I've learned only recently how, how terrible um, neonicotinoids are, the imidacloprids, those seed coatings we put on our corn, corn and soybeans, they're 7,000 times more toxic than DDT to our insects. And we've loaded the landscape with them. Habitat loss, you know, what does that mean? It means you're taking away everything the insects need. We do that everywhere. Plant choice, of course, we want to choose the native plants that support the insects. Invasive species aren't supporting our insects. Light pollution is killing insects at night. And of course, we have climate change. There's good news here, believe it or not. And that is that these five causes here are easily addressed in very short order by single individuals. Climate change, not so much. That's going to be tougher. Uh, but you as an individual can stop using pesticides. You can return habitat to, your, to your, the land that you can manipulate, choose the right plants, turn off your lights, and get rid of your invasive species. These are things we all can do. In other words, we've got to raise the bar about, about what we're asking our landscapes to do. This is a, a house down the street from me. We got a lot of houses like this where I live. It's a beautiful lawn, but that's about all it, all it is. In the past, when we chose plants for our landscapes, we did it for one reason, to make them beautiful. Um, because we've, we've come to believe that plants are just decorations. And we can go anywhere in the world and get pretty plants and, and it'll be great. No thought to the, uh, the ecological role that plants uh, actually, actually play. So when we think of plants only as decorations and we landscape that way, then landscaping becomes ecological destruction. This is a pretty art form. Is it a functioning ecosystem? Absolutely not. But we can choose pretty plants 
that also perform uh, ecosystem uh, roles. They create ecosystem services. They create our life support. They support the food webs that run the ecosystems. They protect our watersheds. They store carbon. They restore our soil, moderate our weather, safe havens for pollinators, natural enemies. All of these things are what make ecosystems run. And when we add uh, ecological function as a criterion to, to selecting the plants around us, then landscaping equals ecosystem restoration. So uh, this is 21st, landscape, 21st century landscaping uh, that I think we need to give a try. I know we need to give it a try. We've done 20th century landscaping and we're now in the sixth great extinction. So that hadn't worked too well. Let's give 21st century landscaping uh, a try. Okay, what does this have to do with, with making insects? Well, you can't restore ecosystem function without restoring insect population. So let's talk directly about that. Which insects should we make? Which insect population should we increase? There are a lot of insects out there. At least a lot of insect species, three to four million species estimated worldwide. It's estimated because we still haven't identified most of them. We have 164,000 species that are described in the U.S., but I can still go out in, in my yard uh, almost any day, <clears throat> run a light trap and catch a moth that nobody's described yet. So still a lot of work to be done. Uh, but we, you know, we're not going to have uh, four million species of insects in our yard. So which ones should we focus on? I think there's two groups. Uh, that we can't do without. So the two most important insect groups. Uh, and first, they're the insects that maintain plant diversity. We, of course, need the plants for the first trophic level. We need those plants. They're the ones capturing the energy from the sun, turning it into food and supporting everything else. So we absolutely need the insects that support plant diversity. But then we have to get the energy that those plants have captured from the sun to animals. Most vertebrates don't eat um, plants directly. So we have to, we have to choose plants that are going to share their energy with the insects that those vertebrates eat in order to transfer plant from those energy. So what, what are the two groups we're talking about? We're talking about pollinators. Then we're talking about caterpillars. So people know about this. We've got to, got to support these. Most people are not, not talking about the caterpillars very much. Let's talk about uh, pollinators first. And I'm not going to say much about them because so many people are talking about pollinators. Um, we have a pretty good handle on what we need to do to save them. Um, a lot of people don't understand why we need pollinators, and I don't blame them because they hear all the time that we need to save pollinators because they pollinate our crops, a third of our crops. May, May Berenbaum, University of Illinois, looked at that figure and has no idea where it came from. Um, she thinks it's, it's closer to a twelfth of our, our crops. And I don't like this as a justification for saving pollinators because people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Incorrect. You need pollinators everywhere because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. That is not an option. Where do we need these pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. When we're talking about saving pollinators, we're not talking about good land stewardship. We're talking about essential land stewardship. We can't do without them. That's it. That's all we're going to say about pollinators until a little bit later in the, in the talk. What about those caterpillars? Caterpillars have been described as the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs, believe it or not, because they are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. I've got any other type of insect here, but any other type of plant eater at all, which means if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, uh, we have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. So that's our challenge. How do we how do we build these beautiful landscapes, um, and at the same time increase the number of caterpillars in our yard? You know, in the past we have chosen plants specifically because nothing would eat them. If you have a plant decoration in your yard, you want it to be perfect. You, you want it to be like a postcard and never change. If you've got a little bit of of uh, uh, feeding damage on a plant, you're going to spray it. Make sure you have killed it. And we're good at that. We've done it everywhere. And of course, we've got insect decline. So how do we add insects to landscapes in an aesthetically pleasing way? Well, we do that by adding the plants that support those insects. And then you add the things that eat those, those insects so they never get out of, out of whack. It all starts with, with plant choice. 
And this seems easy enough, um, but there is a catch. And that is that, that most plants don't support a lot of insects. Most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which plants we choose. And we have to be fussy about it because caterpillars themselves are fussy. Why is that? What I mean is most plants uh, or most caterpillars are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular types of plants. And the monarch butterfly, of course, illustrates that perfectly. It's only going to be in your yard if you have milkweeds. You're only going to make more monarchs if you have milkweeds. Uh, and if you take the milkweeds out and put hostas in, the monarch's not going to start eating your hostas. It's locked into eating milkweeds because it has specialized on that particular genus of plants. Why? Well, remember, plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have, they have loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. I mean, milkweeds are filled with, with that, that milky sap that glues mouth parts together and cardiac glycosides that, that uh, will stop your heart if you eat enough of it. Uh, well, all plants have, have defenses like that. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. That's because not because there's no insects out there to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? Well, they do that through host plant specialization. 90% of the insects that eat plants uh, can only eat the particular plants for which they have adaptations to get around those chemical defenses. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it does take a long period of evolutionary history with those plants, interacting with those plants for all these adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, they have locked the insect into eating that particular uh, plant, and which is again, why if, if, you, if you take that milkweed out and put in the hostas, the monarch can't start eating your hostas. It is locked into milkweed and its only option then is to go elsewhere or, or simply starve to death. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. Uh, we're not going to be able to support insects at home or restore uh, ecosystem function driven by healthy food webs if we choose the wrong plants. So for example, if I want to have the Pandora Sphinx at my house, I'm going to plant Virginia creeper because that's what it eats. If I want the tulip tree silk moth, I'm gonna plant tulip tree. This is host plant specialization. If I want the luna moth, I'm gonna plant sweet gum because where I live, that's the only thing it eats. And as you move around the country, it eats a few other things, but locally it's highly specialized. Zebra swallowtail, one host, pawpaw. If I want the eight spotted forester moth and a number of other uh, moths, uh, I'm gonna plant native grapes. That's what their host plant is. The green marble, what a wonderful name, is on uh, native viburnums. Uh, a number of things, 110 caterpillar species on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet. The beautiful utilia is a specialist on poison ivy. I know what you're thinking, poison ivy, I got to kill that myself. You know when people get poison ivy? When they try to get rid of it, just leave it alone. The best defense against poison ivy is recognizing what it looks like and not touching it. Plus, you get the beautiful utilia and several other moss species and very valuable berries if you leave your poison ivy. If you have persimmon, you get the sculptured moth. The uh, black gum will give you the Hebrew. Fawn sphinx uh, will give you, uh, no, ashes will give you the fawn sphinx. You know, I, that is so beautiful. I think that's, that's uh, art in the garden right there. Number of sphinxes are on our beleaguered ashes which of course means if ash disappears, we lose those sphinxes. 95 species depend on ash. And this is why the emerald ash borer that's killing our ashes is such an ecological disaster. Maples give us the beautiful rosy maple moth. The, the, um, one of my favorite large moths, the royal walnut moth is on walnut or hickory. This poor guy is already extirpated from New England. Uh, just another example of our, our uh, beautiful moths disappearing. Double tooth prominent on elm, witch hazel, dagger moth on, on witch hazel, imperial moths are, are on pine primarily, but they'll also get on black cherry, believe it or not. Spotted thyrus on clematis, two-toned ancillus on ironwood, the lost owlet on bush, button bush, the herald on native willows, snowberry clearwing on coral honeysuckle, the beautiful evening primrose moth, believe it or not, is on evening primrose. Spends the day with his head stuffed in the, in the flowers. It's very cute. Showy emerald on sumac, and I don't mean poison sumac. I've never even seen poison sumac. That's a plant of the swamp. 
I'm talking about staghorn or smooth sumac, great soil stabilizer. You never have to plant a non-native plant to stabilize our soils. We've got plenty of good natives that do that. Then we have some real powerhouses like native prunus, things like black cherry or pin cherry, support the, uh, the white furcula, crocus geometer, the io moth, the cecropia moth, the colorful zale, the tufted bird dropping moth. And I ask you, who would not want the tufted bird dropping moth? Or the paddle caterpillar. This is an educational event here. Tell your kids, go out and find a caterpillar, a paddle caterpillar, and then figure out what these paddles are for. They're not there for decorations. They have a, an important function. And I'm not going to tell you what that function is. I want you to think about what it is, too. It's the same thing that these, these filaments on the filament geometer are doing. They have a very important function. The small-eyed sphinx is on, on native cherries. Harris is three-spot. Uh, which holds its shed um, head capsules in an umbrella over its head here. We used to not know what that was all about. Uh, they actually, it's, it's a defensive mechanism. If you come up, touch this guy, he, he whacks you with it. He whips him back and forth. Uh, and then the most productive plant at all is, is one of our oaks. We'll give you the hag moth, the red wash prominent, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak uh, uh, moth, the skiff moth, White blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, orange patch smoky wing, the half oval ancillus, the crown slug, pink striped oak worm, my favorite, the spun glass slug, and hundreds and hundreds of other species of moths are on oaks. And that's why I call oaks keystone plants. Keystone plant, remember what a keystone is? This is, this is a Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. And if you take the stone out of the arch, the arch falls apart. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web falls apart because the keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs, which means 86% of our native plants are contributing, but not that much. So we really depend on these guys. Uh, and oaks are the top keystone plant in 84% of the counties in which they occur in North America. In the mid-Atlantic states, they're supporting 557 species of caterpillars. Just to put that in perspective, tulip trees, important trees, they're beautiful, tallest, straightest tree in the farthest, they only produce uh, 21 species of, of caterpillars. Uh, oaks are supporting over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. And that's why I, I, I say our keystone plants are the two by fours that are holding up the ecological house that we're building in, in our yards. They're essential to hold up that house. In the past, we have tried to build houses out of, of wallpaper uh, and that doesn't work. No wonder we have ecosystem collapse in our yards. So, uh, so they're essential, keystone plants are essential, things like oaks and, and cherries, but they are, they're not the only thing in your yard. So you're not finished building your house when you have your keystone plants, but they are an important component of it. So where do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website uh, and, and put in your zip code in the ranked list of the most productive uh, woody and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. And this is what a typical list will look like in, in an awful lot of places of the country. Notice I say, so oaks are typically number one here and then prunus and salix. But I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and say, I wanna buy a cherry, uh, undoubtedly they're gonna sell me uh, ornamental cherry from, from uh, China, from Asia. If I wanna buy a willow, it'll be a weeping willow from Turkey. If I wanna buy a birch, it's probably going to be uh, a, a, a European birch. You have to specify that you want a native member of these very important genera. Because if you don't, if you get a non-native member, it's gonna reduce caterpillar use by 68%. We have done that, that experiment. These are the top producing uh, herbaceous plants, not just in terms of making caterpillars, but in terms of making specialist bees. We'll mention this again a little bit, but, but um, we've got about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. So goldenrods are always very important. Uh, in, in my yard, there are 13, 13 species of native bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of goldenrods. The various genera, the asters were broken up into very important um, native sunflowers, particularly the perennial sunflowers. Uh, extremely important in terms of supporting specialists. So with those three genera alone, 
you can have over 40 species of, of native bees in your yard that won't be there unless you have those, those genera. Where did I take all the pictures I just showed you? I took them in my yard, and this is what our yard looked like when, when we moved in uh, in the year 2000. It was part of a, a farm that had been broken up and been mowed for hay when we moved in. So you know, there were very, very few plants there. And this is what it looks like in the summertime today, um, taken from the same, same perspective. So we've got a little lawn here, we're very traditional, but I put a lot of plants back. Uh, and you know, since we moved in, our research has shown that uh, that you can measure the quality of your ecosystem very simply by by measuring the number of species of caterpillars that are making a living there, because they're driving the food web that supports everything else. So for the past, it's probably five years now, I've been taking pictures of every moss species I found on our property, and I'm up to 1,140 species of moss, and we have 10 acres. Uh, good chunk of land, but Pennsylvania, where we live, is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the land mass, uh, we're supporting 44% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And we have those, those species because we planted the plants that support them. We planted witch hazels and oaks and persimmons and American elm and on and on and on. These plants weren't here. This, you know, what was here before was, was cows and, and invasive species and before that, corn, and I don't know if they ever had soybeans or not, but uh, we put the native plants back, and this is just some of them, and we tolerated a whole bunch of native plants that were here on their own, that a lot of people call, call weeds. Black cherries call the weed all over the place, and that's because it comes in on its own. That's great. Virginia creeper. Nobody likes Virginia creeper. It's a great native plant. Goldenrod. There's our poison ivy down here. Even dotter. All of these things are supporting uh, particular species of, of moss. And every time I add a new plant lineage to our yard, I get new species of, of insects. Uh, and because we have all of these caterpillars, all this bird food in our yard, we've got birds too. We've got wood thrush because we've got Virginia creeper making the, the lettered sphinx. Wood thrushes love to feed their babies sphinxes. We've got indigo bunnies because we have allers that, that are making ruby quakers. We've got chipping sparrows because we have black walnut making gray edge boma locusts. We have field sparrows because we have oaks making red line panopotas, tufted tip mice because we have black cherries making dowdy pinions. We've got phoebes because we've got native grasses making skippers. We've got robins. Robins eat worms, yeah, but they eat a lot of moths too. And it's the weeds, the native weeds that are making those, those moths, like the white line sphinx. We've got Carolina chickadee because we have tulip trees making tulip tree beauties. White eyed vireos because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtails. House wrens because we have hickories making the copper underwing. And of course, bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence. We have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. Why is that important? Because it counters these, these headlines that we keep seeing. This is another one we see all the time. World Wildlife Fund says we've lost two thirds of Earth's wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic, but I'm thinking not at our house. I'm sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We simply put the native plants back that support the insects that then support all of the other forms of wildlife. So by choosing the right plants and choosing more of them, we really could store, restore insect populations nearly everywhere. This could be a typical uh, yard, folks. It really could. This is Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. It's a native plant, probably the largest native plant uh, garden in the entire country. So I'm going to leave you by talking about nine things that you can do to restore ecosystems in your yard by restoring the insects in those ecosystems. And the first one is something I've talked about quite often, uh, and that is we need to reduce the area that we have in lawn. We've got uh, over 40 million acres of lawn. That's a 2005 statistic. That's an area bigger than New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Now I know we need lawn uh, because we need to advertise our high status. I understand that. And we also need to, to uh, display our, our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in, in half? Here's a, a, a uh, I drive by this church in Mississippi when I go down there. Uh, and, and I always think, you know, the people are inside the church uh, worshiping God's creations. And on the outside, they're killing them with all this lawn. So we're not, we're not thinking. If we cut the area of lawn in half, we've got 20 million acres. We can, we can create homegrown national park with it. 
The other thing we wanna do is, is plant for specialist bees. Now we talked about that. Um, Sam Drogi, he is Mr. Native Bee, uh, at least in the east, east. And he says, when you plant a pollinator garden, you really want to plant for the specialists because the generalist bees, the bumblebees and honeybees and other things that can use a number of types of flowers will go to those same plants. So when you plant for the specialists, you're meeting the needs of all the bees. If you only plant for the generalists, you're only meeting the needs of the generalists. And then you lose more than a third of our, our native bees. Um, keystone plants, we wanna use keystone plants. Uh, and, and this is a new website up by the National Wildlife Federation um, that is focused on, uh, it talks about the keystone plants for, for caterpillars, but it also talks about the keystone plants for specialist bees. And it's the first uh, such website uh, up there uh, for, for general use. Um, so go to this, this website and um, for your eco region, it will tell you the best plants for supporting specialist bees. It's a very powerful tool. Okay, remove invasive species from your property. Remember all that privately owned land, 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi? If everybody got rid of the invasive species on their private property, we would be 85.6% done. A lot of work, I understand that. Uh, but it also, it, you know, it, it, it reduces the amount of work just to the property that you own, your little piece of the earth that you're responsible for. It's certainly doable. And that will reduce the seed rain down on our natural areas that's coming from all of our, all the invasive species on our private property. Um, so commonly planted invasives, we know what they are. English ivy is certainly a big one. <coughs> What's interesting to me is when I started giving these talks years ago, there were people on the talk circuit that would talk about English ivy and say, you know, it's not invasive in the East, it's only invasive in Oregon. They don't say that anymore, of course, because now it's invasive everywhere. Uh, when, when a plant is invasive anywhere, you gotta be suspicious that it's going, it's just getting started. Calorie pear, one of the worst, or people call it Bradford pear. Um, porcelain berry, this is the kudzu of the North, by the way, it covers everything else. Sorry, I gotta keep coughing here. <coughs> Excuse me. Burning bush, uh, privet, millions of acres of privet in the South. Uh, so it's not just just uh, kudzu in the south that's that's covering everything. Um, Chinese elm, another big one. I I, I left off uh, bush honeysuckle. I should have that on here. Um, huge huge uh, invasive everywhere. So these are commonly ones that that are sold and planted everywhere, and uh, that's a huge mistake. We can get rid of these on our property. Use keystone plants. Well, we talked about how important they were. We certainly want to increase the, the percentage of them when we're putting plants back. When we're reducing the area that's in lawn, replace it with uh, at least some keystone plants. Landscape for caterpillars. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, <coughs> where oak support, it's actually 511 species of, of, of caterpillars. Now, this is just an example. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. So the caterpillar eats the leaves, it spins a cocoon and hangs from, from one of the branches. Uh, then it emerges as an adult and then it does it all again, uh, all over again on the tree. I wish everything did that though, but most things don't. 480 of those species, 94% will finish growing as a caterpillar on the tree, then they drop from the tree and wiggle themselves beneath the soil surface and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we mow and compact our soils under our tree so that they're rock hard and a caterpillar can't get underground, which makes the typical way we landscape an ecological trap. Uh, if these were, were if these were oaks, for example, probably Norway maples, I don't know, but um, a moth would come in, lay their eggs here, the caterpillars would grow, and then they drop down and die. And I think that the, the, the way we landscape under our trees is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is, is not the solution either. This is what most people do. Plant a tree uh, in, in a yard. We're actually going to start measuring it this, this summer, um, how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this, where you have a, a tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood up here, uh, and then a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. This is, this is a safe site for those caterpillars, soft landing. They can, they can drop down 
the soil is not compacted. Nobody's going to step on them. Nobody's going to mow them. They can get underground and pupate high survivorship or spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under here. This is the, this is the goal. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you reduce the lawn. You put beds around your trees. Uh, these are all safe sites for, for those caterpillars that are up in those, those trees. Liberally use your, your ground covers like uh, wild ginger uh, or mayapple or foam flowers or ferns. Ferns are great ground cover. This is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any uh, caterpillar developing in these trees can drop down into this, this fern bank and complete its development, even though it's the middle of a city because of the landscape underneath that, those trees. Reduce your light pollution. There's a lot of research coming out in the last, last 10 years uh, that's pretty convincing. Light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines uh, because these lights attract nocturnal insects uh, and, and then they kill them. These are all the ways that, that uh, insects die at lights from exhaustions or collisions with the light. They get incinerated, they die of dehydration. The bat comes and picks them off or they, they just spend the night sitting on the edge of the, of the uh, building that the light is on, and then the birds pick them off in the morning. It blinds them, who knew? Uh, and they should be doing other things, but, but instead they're stuck there at, at that light. Well, to me, this is, this is again, more good news. We've got to turn around insect declines. That's what we're talking about here. We you know, have lost 45% of the things that are running the world. If we can do that by just flipping a switch, turning out our lights at night. We're getting off easy. But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn my light out over my garage at night or over my front porch because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to recognize is the bad man doesn't come very often. Or take the white bulb that is out of your security light, take it out and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb would be the best choice because yellow wavelengths, it turns out, are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white wavelengths. So this is the easiest solution. It's also the cheapest. If we were to take our white bulbs out and replace them with yellow bulbs overnight uh, during the right season, we would save millions of insects and millions of dollars too because, of course, LEDs are much more energy efficient. Opposed mosquito spraying. Um, Mosquito Joe, you know, that's just one company, but this is a booming business all around, uh, all around the country. And they're single-handedly undoing <clears throat> all the things I've been talking about for the last 20 years. But Mosquito just says it's okay because this is, um, this is a natural product. And, and it is, it's a pyrethroid based fog. That's the compound that is in chrysanthemums. Uh, but, you know, cyanide is a natural product, too. Uh, many of our fruit trees have cyanide and other things in them. So, so I don't think that's a good, a good uh, reason to be spraying this. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. And I wish they were true. I really wish that, that was true. But in fact, this, this fog kills all the, all the insects it comes in contact with. So if you're, if you're fogging everything in your yard to kill mosquitoes, you've just killed everything that you've, you've landscaped your, your yard for. I don't know if you remember the headlines from two falls ago, not this past fall, but two years ago, big monarch kills as they flew through Mosquito Joe here on their way to Mexico. Hundreds of monarchs dead on the ground. So it kills everything except adult mosquitoes. Now it does kill adult mosquitoes, but not enough. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%. So he's not even close to being uh, effective enough to control the population. If you really want to control, oh dear, what did I just do? Huh. Don't What's wrong, Doug? What's wrong? My, oh, did I open a website? Oh, there no, we go. We're still seeing your Mosquito Joe. Okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a website. Let me get rid of this. All right, there we go. Oh, come on, stop this. It's not letting me advance my, how about this? There we go. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. If you want to kill, uh, control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. Uh, and this is the most directed, cheapest way to do it. Get, uh, get a bucket and fill it full of water. <clears throat> and people always say, well, how big a bucket? 
I don't care how big a bucket, just get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay uh, and let it ferment for a few days. This is, this is during the warm part of the season. What you're doing is building up the population of diatoms uh, and, and algae. And that's what larval mosquitoes eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to ovipositing mosquitoes. The females will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and get mosquito dunks. This is Bacillus thuringiensis, cheap, nine bucks. Um, so this is a natural bacterium that uh, it's the formulation that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. Uh, so it's completely targeted. If a, if a uh, dragonfly gets in here, it's not gonna hurt it. If your dog drinks it or, or uh, a, a bird drinks it, no problem at all. You might put a coarse screen over your bucket so a chipmunk doesn't fall in there and, and drown. But um, the only thing you're going to kill is mosquitoes, and you're going to do it uh, without spending a whole lot of money. So if everybody had mosquito uh, dunk buckets in their yard, we would kill a lot of mosquitoes uh, in, in, in only mosquitoes. Okay, as a matter of fact, we're talking about insecticides. Let's minimize insecticide use at all. If you want to know how many insecticides are bought, go to Home Depot or any other place and look at the insecticide shelf. They're selling a lot of stuff out there. They're all designed to kill insects in and around the home, uh, most of which are totally harmless. Now we're not talking about termites here. We do have to control termites. That's done these days with baits that is also very targeted, but uh, just spraying anything that moves in your house, including spiders, which are not insects, they're there eating the mosquitoes, by the way, is just doesn't make sense uh, in, in today's world. Finally, <clears throat> join your, your homeowners association, your civic association that has all these rules that says you can't do what Doug Tallamy says. Um, and then change those rules from within. Those rules were made uh, primarily during the 70s when we, you know, we didn't want rusty cars in our front yards because that suggested we weren't high status people. So we all are high status people. But then they went crazy and started to tell you exactly how you could landscape so that we all looked identical. Um, that made no ecological sense at all. And, and we need to change those, those rules. So you can add native plants to your yard. You can add, a, add them attractively, uh, but we have to change, change the rules and get you permission to do that. And by the way, the state of Maryland has, has there was just a court case that says HOAs cannot, they're no longer allowed to tell people they're not allowed to use native plants. Uh, so that's a step in the right direction. But changing from within is much more effective than telling somebody you can't do something from outside. Okay, I'm going to end uh, the same way I started, and that's with, with E.O. Wilson. His entire career, he was trying to save life on Earth. He loved biodiversity. Uh, and in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And in that book, he said, <clears throat> you know, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to have functioning ecosystems. We have to save nature on at least half of planet Earth. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we're gonna do that, uh, which, you know, the conservation biologist saving half the, the Earth sounds like a, a great idea, but it's still a head scratcher. Remember half the Earth is already in some form of agriculture and we've got 8 billion people in all of our detritus and, and the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how are we going to do that? I think we can do that, but we've got to change our, our approach to conservation. In the past, we've tried to conserve areas where there weren't a lot of humans. There's not enough of those areas left anymore. So we now need, uh, uh, we need to embrace the concept that humans and nature are going to coexist. Give up that notion that we've got to be segregated. We're gonna coexist for the first time in history. <clears throat> I think it's our only viable option uh, and I think we can do it, but we've got to save insects where humans dominate in order to succeed in that. It doesn't mean that you have to save insects for a living. Although as an entomologist, I will tell you it's been a good living, but you can save them where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. This approach empowers you. The earth is full of serious problems these days. And, you know, people look at that and say, well, what can one person do? One person can do the nine things we just talked about. They can shrink their lawn. They can get rid of their invasive plants. They can use keystone plants. They can put in pollinator gardens. They can turn out their lights. They can fire mosquito Joe. They can do all kinds of things that will increase the ecological integrity of the, the landscape where they live. 
Um, and that, of course, will, will uh, enhance the local ecosystem rather than degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You will get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that, that you own, that you can manipulate. And if you don't any, own any land, help somebody. I mean, if you don't, yeah, if you don't own land, help somebody who does. So if you're working, if you live in a, an apartment or something, volunteer for a, a land conservancy or a park or preserve. Help the little old lady next to you who has a lot of land but can't, can't manage it. Um, volunteers can be extremely important in this conservation message. So insect decline is, is, a, is a global problem, but it does have a grassroots solution. We created the problem, we can certainly solve it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doug. Your pictures are beautiful. I mean, it's, it's amazing how, how truly beautiful so many of our insects are. How did they, yeah. get, how did they get such a bad rap for so many years? They're gorgeous. Well, because some of them bite us and the rest, some eat our crops. And, you know, it's just a few bad apples that have given them that. Bad. Isn't that always the way, the few bad apples? Do you have time for a few questions? I do. I do. Wonderful. So uh, myself and uh, Mary Gelder are going to be popping some questions at you. Do you have a question, Mary? Oh, sure. Um, first question. Climate change is altering national natural habitats faster than some species can disperse seeds or migrate to areas in which they might survive. There are groups of people who are attempting to assist the migration of certain trees by planting seeds in privately owned refuges farther north of their native range where the tree or plant might survive. Do you have an opinion on assisted migration? I do. Um, it is a controversial subject, so it is my opinion. Uh, but remember what happened right around this time last year when we had a deep freeze that went all the way down to Mexico, devastated Mex uh, Texas. Um, I was just in Texas yesterday, I guess. Uh, and they still remember that. Uh, it, went, it got down to 10 degrees. Um, so it's an example of what climate change is really doing. It's not a gradual warming of the planet. I mean, over time it is, but it's the, it's the increase erratic nature of, of weather systems. You get hotter hots, but you get colder colds too. You get more rain, you get bigger droughts. It's really erratic weather. And if we start moving plants north, you get those cold snaps, those polar, polar vortices and bomb cyclones and all the things that are happening more frequently, and it's gonna take them out. So what we need to do, I think, is um, we want to promote the most genetic variation in the native plants that we have where they are, so that they can adapt as, as best as possible. So, uh, you know, there, it depends on how far you're, you're moving them north. So, you know, if you're talking about a hundred miles, I wouldn't worry about that. But if you really make a big jump, you're also taking that native plant and moving it away from the things it co-evolved with. If it's there to support the life around you and you move it away from that life, you haven't accomplished that, that much either. So um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, one of the ways we can increase genetic variability is to make sure when we buy plants in the nursery that um, they're not cultivars because cultivars are, are all cloned. It's one genetic variant to, to uh, promote one particular uh, you know, aesthetic trait. So that's, we know that's not a good idea. So The famous tomato hornworm caterpillar, are there any birds that eat those? Oh, yes. Cardinals love them. Cardinals love all of the, the sphinx moths. You want to control your, your tomato hornworms. Um, there's, you know, the little white cocoons on their back. People think they're insect eggs. Those are braconid wasps. They're parasitoids. And after they have eaten at the center of the, the caterpillar, they tunnel out through its, its exoskeleton. They spin a cocoon on its back. So a single tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm can, can create you know, 150 braconid wasps that are going to go off and look for other tomato hornworms. Well, if you have, they get on a number of species of sphinx moths. So for example, at my house, I have 17 species of sphinx moths that somebody always has those braconid wasps around. So when we get the tobacco hornworm, which is not very often, 
those those wasps are there right away. We have a natural enemy complex because of the native plants around us that are supporting the hosts of the natural enemies that control that specific uh, tomato hornworm. So if you have a landscape with no other sphinx moths around, then you have no braconid wasps and it goes crazy on your tomatoes before it can be controlled. Okay. Are there any bird species that eat beetles? Yes, but beetles, <clears throat> there's a whole long reason why, why birds prefer caterpillars. Uh, and one of the reasons is that they're soft, so you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And beetles, beetles, I talk about uh, caterpillars being like little sausages. Well, beetles are like little tanks. Uh, they've got a lot of exoskeletons, very thick, and um, so much of a beetle is undigestible. So there are birds, particularly in the, the West, some of the thrashers and things will eat a lot of beetles because that's pretty much all that's there in a lot of places. But it's a much tougher thing to eat um, they have to grind them up in their, their crops. They have a lot of sharp edges. So when, a, beetle, when a, a, a bird has a choice, they will always take a caterpillar over the beetle. We have a number of, a couple of questions here. Because we're in a, a, a highly congested, uh, the suburbs of Chicago, uh, most of our area, the landscapes are on the smaller side, quarter, acre, less, more, thereabouts. Although oaks being so important, do you have any smaller oak species or dwarf oak species that you would recommend for these smaller landscapes? Yes, I do. Quercus prinoides. Dwarf, dwarf, is that dwarf chestnut oak? Quercus prinoides. <laughs> I think it's dwarf chestnut. Um, it'll make acorns when it's five feet tall. I've got some in, in my yard, but it's a perfect small oak for, for uh, landscapes in the Chicago area. Uh, How tall you, have you seen those get? Uh, 15 feet. Okay. You're not talking about 100 foot trees with 100 foot canopy spreads. You know, another way that you can get uh, oaks into your yard is through coppicing, believe it or not. So you know what coppicing is? You, you let the tree get uh, maybe three or four inches in diameter and then cut it off at the base and it'll come back as a bush. Then after 10 years, maybe it's got another leader, cut that off again, it'll be a bush again. So you can have an oak bush and you can do that indefinitely by you keep cutting off the leader as it gets too tall. I like that. <laughs> well, those be just as beneficial to caterpillars. Sure. Tall ones. Trees. Why not? <laughs> okay. Are silver, ma silver maples a good um, keystone species? Maples are, are uh, near the top. So we're talking about the top 14%. Maples are certainly in there. Um, they're not you know, they're, they support maybe 150 species of caterpillars compared to 500, but it's still very good. It, they haven't gotten to the point where it drops off to a very, very low numbers. So yes, I would not avoid maples at all. I would avoid the Norway maples. Just stick to your native maples. We've got plenty of them. What are your thoughts on food forests, permaculture using natives to provide food for humans, insects, birds, and other wildlife? It's a, it's a good idea. Um, we don't, you know, unfortunately, there's not that many native plants that provide that much food for, for we humans. I mean, you can get persimmons, you can get the nut trees, and that's, that's important. Um, pawpaws, but, uh, you know, and, and, and our berries and our, our fruits, it's all good ideas. Uh, but, you know, we, we eat an awful lot of corn and we eat an awful lot of soybeans. And, and, and so that's, that's really what we're existing on these, these days. But I, I support it for sure. Okay. So along with those uh, plants that you just mentioned, uh, so Jen wants to know uh, if plants like sunflower, pawpaw, nut trees, and others are examples of a plant species with multiple uses. So bird food and insect food and human food. So do you have any thoughts on multi-use Yeah, you know, that, that anytime you can kill two or three or four or five birds with one stone, do it. And that's a great idea. 
You know, it's one of the reasons I like oak so much. Not only do they make so much bird food, they also make those acorns, which is great mammal food. They're also wonderful for our, our watershed in terms of managing the watershed with their, their root system and their big canopies. They also sequester more carbon uh, than, than most other plants. The only thing they don't do better than most plants is support pollinators because they're wind pollinated. So you're, you're, you're hitting several important ecological roles with one type of tree. So anytime you can do that with a plant, you certainly want to do it. If you do have a larger property, are there any types of organizations or businesses that will come out and look at your property and identify invasives and help you remove them? You know, that that's local. So in Delaware, there are, there's the Delaware okay. Nature Society that will come out and do exactly that for free. Um, but I don't know around the country how many, how many groups are doing that. Um, it's certainly a, a need. <clears throat> Most people don't garden themselves. They hire somebody. Mm -hmm. They hire somebody to mow the lawn and just take care of it because they're too busy doing other things. So uh, there is a great need for what I'm calling ecological landscaping or ecological gardening, where instead of hiring the mow, blow and go guys and not worrying about it, you hire these people and not worry about it. They will install the plants that you need. They will maintain them. They'll get rid of your invasives. They'll do whatever needs to be done without you telling them because they already know. Um, that is a, an empty niche. If you're young and looking for a new career, I predict that's going to be a really important one in the near future. I, it's one right now. We just don't have enough people. So. Not enough of them. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, leaving the leaves? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of reasons why leaves are a really important um, source of ecosystem services. When they drop from a tree, they've got all the nutrients that tree used that year tied up in them. If we rake them up and throw them out, we've just thrown away all those nutrients. So what needs to happen over time is that those leaves be broken down by the detritivores under your tree, all the things that live in the soil <clears throat> and return the nutrients to the soil so that your tree can take it up again. There's also, there's 70 species of litter moths that eat dead leaves. When you rake it up, you're throwing away all of those species. All of those, those uh, caterpillars that dropped out of the tree and pupated in the leaves, you're throwing them away. You're throwing away the, the beautiful banded hair streak which uh, eats its caterpillars, eat dead oak leaves on the ground. Um, you're throwing away the blanket that protects soil organisms. All of our soil organisms, and, and we have more species underground than we do above ground, by the way, require high humidity. What maintains high humidity in the soil? It's leaf litter on, on the, the ground. So how do we keep leaf litter in our suburban yards or our urban yards without upsetting everybody? I think it's part of the, of the building those beds under your trees. Step one is to kill the grass under your tree. And the best way to do that is put a, a mat of leaves under there and, and that smothers the grass. Then you plant right through that. So you want a, you want a, uh, a ground cover of plants. You won't even see the leaves after that. And every year you, you put the leaves back in there and then they will slowly degrade. But you're building an ecosystem from the ground up by keeping those leaves on your property. We have learned that when it rains, we want all the rain that falls on our property to stay on our property because we want it to infiltrate and get down to the, to the water table rather than running off as stormwater. Uh, well, we want the same thing with our leaves. You want every leaf to, that falls on your property to stay on your property at least somewhere so that the nutrients can return to the soil and it'll nourish the plants that, that are also on your property. It can be a little tricky. A lot of people want to mow them, uh, so grind them up into little, little fragments. Of course, that grinds up everything that's in those leaves at the same time. It's better than raking them and throwing them away because at least the nutrients are still there, but it also shortens the lifespan of those leaves. A single oak leaf can take three years to break down. If you mow it, it breaks down very quickly. Uh, leaf litter like uh, from maples or birches, they don't even make it through a single season. So if you mow them, it, it, you've, you've lost that, those benefits very, very quickly. Should we keep planting, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, should we keep planting native ash species and should we treat them or should we just keep producing saplings that will get taken out by the emerald ash borer? Well, that's a good question and it's a judgment call. If you have a prized ash on your, your property and you want to try to save it, 
Uh, at this point, I would treat it because we're actually making pretty good progress with um, biocontrol of Emmer lash borer. Uh, there are three or four species of wasps that are showing good promise and control. Um, there was a, a place in New Jersey last year that had 80% control of, of uh, Emmer lash borer because of these natural enemies. Um, so that's, that's great. Uh, we still, still have work to do. Uh, and if you want to keep your ash around until these natural enemies are, are uh, have been, you know, the populations are big enough to keep the, the borer under control, um, that would that would work. Should you keep planting ashes? Yes, I you you should. It's too important a tree to say we're just going to give up on it. And we keep looking for natural resistance to emerald ash borer. There are a few populations in Michigan, believe it or not, that did not die. There was natural resistance in there. Uh, those are going to be the future ashes uh, that, that uh, are going to spread. Um, so if we give up on every time our trees are challenged, if we give up on oaks because they get oak wilt or bacterial leaf scorch, if we give up on ashes, if we give up on beaches because of beach blight, we're going to lose all the trees in our, our forest. What we need to do is find resistance to all of these, these problems that we've brought in and those trees will be the, be the future. So I'd say plant more ashes than ever uh, and <laughs> just don't plant them next to your house. This person has been raising black swallowtail caterpillars and releasing the butterflies, but wants to know if she is better off just letting the birds eat the butterflies. <clears throat> um, you mean eat the caterpillars? Or eat the caterpillars. Should she be yeah. trying to save? Yes, eat the caterpillars. Black swallowtails don't taste all that good. So, you know, people think the birds have eaten them all because all of a sudden they're gone off the parsley, whatever they're raising them on. What really has happened is they've crawled off to form their chrysalis in a hidden place. Uh, so uh, I would provide the food plant, let the swallowtails do it on their own. You, you, it's fun to raise them, but they're good at, at, at doing it on, on their own. And if you feed a bird here and there, that's good too. What you want to do is make sure that they've got enough plant material so they can reach reach maturity. So one parsley plant or one carrot uh, or, or one uh, sweet Sicily, whatever it is, is, is not enough. You need a patch so that you can have a good population of these things. So let's ask like two more questions. Okay, um, here's one. Uh, being in New York State, we are on the fringe of the spotted lantern fly infestation occurring in Pennsylvania and New, New Jersey. What can you tell us about them and what kind of impact will they have as an invasive species? You're on the fringe, but I'm in the heart of it. Uh, we've got them all over our property. So that's an interesting question. If you're a, a fruit tree grower, if you you know raise apples, or if you're uh, in, into wine, if you've got wine grapes, they can be a real problem. There is, there is no doubt. Uh, at our house, we've got a lot of uh, native grape vines. Uh, and we have a good population of, of spotted lantern flies. But it's interesting, they're brightly colored, advertising bad taste. But that bad taste typically comes from Alanthus, which is a favorite host plant from China. When you don't have any Alanthus around, they do eat other things and then they don't taste bad. So, what I've noticed at our house is I'm finding a lot of wings everywhere, the birds are learning to eat them. Uh, and, and we've had them uh, three, four years now. Last year was the lowest population yet. And I think the natural enemies are starting to control them when they learn that they don't, they don't taste good. Uh, so at our house, we know we're not growing any fruit trees or anything, and we've never had those huge populations I've seen pictures of. Uh, I don't, you know, maybe we're un unusual that way, but, uh, when you do get a big, a big outbreak of those guys, one thing you can do is, is um, get your garden hose and put the attachment on the end if you, as if you were gonna spray fertilizer, if you know what I mean, and fill it full of soap. So you're actually spraying soapy water. Uh, spotted lantern flies are, are um, homopterans, which depend an awful lot on waxy coatings on their exoskeleton. Uh, and when you spray them with soapy water, it dissolves that wax. It's very unhealthy for them. It knocks them off the tree. Uh, so when they're up there all in the bark and everything, spray them, knock them down, and then step on them. 
<laughs> Otherwise, they're jumping all over the place. So it's a it's a pretty easy way to get control of some big populations. Um, trying to reduce the use of these insecticides that stay around forever. Uh, so that's that's not my first choice. I would try soapy water first. Aaron asks, we are trying to get our neighbors to help fight against the tree of heaven, but no one is interested in investing money to cut them down. Any advice? It feels like well, a losing <clears throat> battle considering how aggressive they are. That, you know, here's where the spotted lanternfly can help you. That is the favorite host and it will generate an awful lot of spotted lanternflies uh, when they come to your house. So just using that uh, excuse alone saying, you know, spotted lanternfly is going to take over the world. We've got to get rid of your Um, You know, maybe the maybe the township can even help help pay for it. If you simply cut them down, you won't get rid of it. That's right. You're going to need some herbicide to kill the root system. Uh, but then you cut it down once and you do get rid of it. It's not they're really not that hard if you paint the stump with with uh, an herbicide. And just one thing, going back to what you were talking about with the leaves, um, somebody asked, uh, Chris asked, how about mulching the leaves in place? That's what I meant by, I think he means grinding them up with the, with the yeah. uh, lawnmower. Yeah, um, it's better than, than raking them away all, you know, and throwing them out. But it does kill all the things that are in those leaves when you send them to the, the lawnmower and it shortens their lifespan. Well, this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great questions tonight. And um, we have a lot of work to do. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And our next webinar will be on March 9th. We'll have Adam Cruiser from the Dark Sky, uh, darksky.org, talking about more in depth about light pollution and how we can help reduce it. Great, thanks. Thanks everyone, good night.